Um, I want to thank NSSEO for partnering with us on all of our education outreach programs and to Caltime Township for their support through a community grant. It helps pay for this facility and printing and videoing and all the other things we try to do. Um, okay, so getting started with the panel today, I want to welcome Tim Auber from Elmhurst College. We're kind of going left to right here. Stacy Watson and Michelle DeCanio from Harper College. Kathy Lambert from Judson University. Nina Johnson from Minnesota Life College. And T.C. Schneck from National Lewis University. Um, I want to thank them for taking time to come and share their information with our families. We really appreciate it. Um, each speaker will be given 10 to 15 minutes to talk about their program. And please, we're going to save all questions to the end. I know it's really hard when you really have a question for a specific program, but we want to make sure everybody gets through all their presentations, and hopefully we'll have time at the end for any questions. In addition, they've all said that they'll, they'll stick around a little late if you have a, you know individual question from one of them. If you don't get to it during our regular hour and a half, you'll have time to come up after. Okay, so let's get started. Some of our presenters have PowerPoints, some do not. So we'll be shifting a little bit away from the table from time to time, but we'll work through it. So I want to get started with Tim from Elmhurst College, and please help me welcome all of our post-secondary My name is uh, Tim Alberg. I'm from Elmhurst College. Uh, we are here to talk a little bit about the ELSA program at Elmhurst College, so I can answer questions about the college at large, too. Uh, ELSA is a four-year college experience program for young adults with different abilities at Elmhurst. It's the Elmhurst Learning and Success Academy. And our whole goal for our program is to basically be our students major at Elmhurst College. We're a specialized program for young adults with different abilities. Generally speaking, on a grade, in grade level terms, our students are probably between fifth and seventh grade, academically speaking, with a kind of a grade <coughs> minimum of third grade for reading, writing, mathematics, and comprehension. So uh, we have quite a mix of students in my program. We have about 48 students currently uh, in the program. So we're, we're, we're still pretty small. We do in small class sizes. And our academic goals are to see that our students still work on academics. So we're still working on reading and writing and math and have some flavors of general education and some more opportunities I'll talk about in a second. Um, so we want to improve on that front. But we also work on independent living skills, social recreational skills, and the big to do for us is the career exploration piece. Uh, we're really hoping that when our students finish our program, they leave us with a better ability to be able to seek out and hold meaningful employment, to have improved academically, and have had the whole kind of hoorah four year college experience and improve their, their social skills or you can say soft skills. We tie that into a job interviews and communication ability that would be relative in a classroom or in a workspace when we can help it. All the while, they take full part of the campus life at Elmhurst. Now, Elmhurst, quick sidebar, is a small four-year liberal arts university or college, we're hoping to become a university, uh, over in Elmhurst, Illinois. Um, not too far from here, it's about a 25 minute drive, depending on who else is on the, uh, the expressway. Um, it was really easy at 10. Uh, but uh, we have about 63 undergraduate majors at the school. Um, we're a Division III college. We have kind of all of the sports and you know, cheerleading and football and basketball and baseball and all the things that a, a big four-year school would have. It's just a little bit of a smaller scale. Elmhurst has about 3,400 students there total, 450, 500 of those students are graduate students. Everybody else tends to be an undergraduate student, either a first year or a transfer student. So we have a pretty healthy population. Uh, some of them commute, probably 65, 70% of our students commute to our college. The remaining just under 1,000 live on campus, including uh, right now, uh, 26 of my students are living on campus at this point in time, which is new ish. Um, we've been doing it for five or six years. Uh, people who knew me from the beginning used to have the commuter program. Well, now we've expanded. We have a, a, a possibility of living on campus. Our students live in residence halls on the campus. We do not have our own little building or separate facility. They live amongst uh, traditional students on campus, though we do have some support for them. Um, we do offer, we have what we call CAs, which are community advisors. They're basically our own RAs, what we 
couldn't use the term RA because there already are RAs, it was too confusing for everyone else. So we have CAs, and they go through RA training, they go through specialized training from us, and we have one for approximately every five to seven ELSA students who live in the residence hall. So basically, we have them broken across floors in a couple of different buildings on campus, and the, the CA serves as sort of the floor boss, and that's where our students uh, have to check in with, and you know, if there's roommate disagreements, roommate agreement policies need to be made, or you know, I'm leaving to go home for the weekend, or a couple of us are going into town to go see a movie, they're the person that they sort of check in with and also manage any kind of conduct issues and those kinds of things. In addition to that, our students who live on campus have individual life coaches whom the parents pay, and they work with your students on kind of a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, preferably in sort of executive functioning roles or social skills or, geez, I don't know how to use the laundry downstairs, can you help me do that? And that's another peer. And so we kind of like to use peer uh, training when we can so that they're you know, interfacing with students their own age and they don't have to have old man Tim come down and tell them how to do laundry. Um, and it works out really well. It also helps them connect with all of our, our clubs and organizations on campus, which is another really exciting aspect for our students. They can participate in everything that we have. Um, we've had a few barriers for some of those things in the past. Um, we're really excited to report that one of the last two are Greek life and official college sports. This year, um, one of my students is a really phenomenal golfer, and the golf coach happened to see him play, and he's like, I really want this guy on my team. And so the athletic director and the coach kind of called up to the NCAA and said, so why is it this, this kid can't participate again? And they're like, well, because uh, we, uh, uh, we didn't we did an analysis and we couldn't come up with a good answer. So guess what? He's on the golf team. Hey. So that doesn't mean every student in the program is going to get onto a sports team. They still have to have that ability, but we at least have that access now, which we didn't used to have. So now I have to do football and cross country and track. So that's, that's kind of a new thing. Um, the last one is the Greek life, which uh, one of my uh, students who got on the cheerleading squad was asked to rush for a sorority, and they accepted her. So she said no, because they wanted money for it. But <laughs> that, was, that was the thing. So we don't really have any more barriers like that on the campus which we used to have. So they can join all our clubs and organizations, they can participate in college sports now, and they can take part in group life if they really want to, although not everybody else. But that's okay. Um, you know, so we're really a part of Elmhurst College. You know, we've had students work on the school paper, we've had students uh, manage you know, sports teams. I do also have a few organizations like Special Olympics. I have a basketball team, a track and field team. We have a Best Buddies chapter there too. So I kind of call those safe organizations that our students are used to from high school and they can kind of help interface and help make um, a lot of friends. Uh, integration is a big piece of it. <coughs> or inclusion, I should say, is a big piece of what we're driving to do, and that leads me to another thing with the academics. Um, a lot of our students have interest outside of what we do in our program. So we created a program called the ELSA Elective Program, where our students are allowed to take college courses at Elmhurst with some support. Um, they're doing it pass no pass, so we kind of have a net up for them, we work with our faculty, we might make some modifications for our students, depending, but we try as best we can to get them to do much of the work as they can so they get the full experience of those classes. They are able to take up to four classes to get a, a separate certificate of specialization if they want to in a particular area. We've got students do that with journalism, business, geography, graphic design. We've got a couple right now working on education certificates because they'd like to work either in daycare or with education. So they're taking classes in all of those respective departments with our support. That gives them a lot of opportunities to mix and mingle with our population as a whole but also, you know, kind of have a unique experience at Elmhurst College with their education. Something new we're building off of that, we're still in sort of a pilot phase with, is we're calling it ELSA Plus. So I had a student doing a business class, and he did really well, and the teacher leaned over to one of my staff members and said, you know, if he was doing this for a grade, he would have gotten an A. And we were, well, really? So we asked the college, um, why can't we do this for a grade? And there's a lot of internal waffling about, well, there's this other system, and let's figure it out. We did. So now, certain students, if they want, can try to pursue those classes for a college credit. And should they be successful with four or more of those classes and build up to be about over 12 semester hours, they, get, they then can consider applying over into a degree program. So we're in the middle of our very first student kind of doing that, and it's a little bit of a, a plate-spinning act, so we're still working off the kinks. 
but it's an avenue towards a degree. Um, because the other thing that we offer in this wheelhouse is we call it the Advantage Program. And that is for students who are a little bit above, academically speaking, what our typical ELSA student would be, but may need some support beyond what a typical accommodation is might be at college. So, those students have the opportunity to come to the college, they get into the college, they apply to be a degree seeking student, but if they choose, they can apply to the ELSA program and take one of my classes on the side too. So that way it's a little bit like a support plus program where they're, you know, it's in, and often in cases, students who might need some executive planning help or are working out sort of balancing this whole new college thing with the new schedule and trying to do homework on my own and not having the resource hour and the whole team of social workers and IEP staff floating around making sure everything's taken care of, we're giving them a little bit of that. But it's still, they have to kind of run their own engine and be independent, but it just gives them somewhat of a net. So ELSA, ELSA Plus, the Advantage Program are kind of three different places that we try to meet our students at our school uh, that give unique opportunities. So I think I ran through everything really fast. Um, so I'll turn it over to the next presenter and look forward to your questions. One last thing, um, if you really like hearing me talk or you want to see some of us in another uh, fashion, I am hosting a transition fair on campus on February 28th. I have flyers up here, so feel free to, to meet by and grab one. Um, I'll be there and Kathy will be there and Nina could wash your hair. Um, I got to invite Harper and uh, Pace will be there too amongst them. And Reach said they're coming to my thing too. So you'll be able to see an assortment of us as well as other providers that work in our community. And I'll be doing my in ELSA info session to kick it off where I'll have some of my students with me and my other staff members. And at the end, we're doing a keynote presentation about the HOPE Handbook, which is something a, a master's degree program at our college put together, which is the hiring of people with differing abilities guidebook that we can take to companies and introduce a whole job coaching process to help companies hire people with different abilities. We beta tested it with five of my alum from the program, and I have five ELSA alumni with full-time union jobs making 14 something an hour at a company called Laco in Elk Grove Village. So we're gonna do that with Laco, continue to do that with Laco. We're starting this deal with Medline for next year, and True Value Hardware has expressed interest in bringing our students there. So it's becoming a really unique avenue to help our students get employment at the end. So you'll hear all about that at my transition fair. And lastly, I have these fancy games of cards you can fill out and get on my mailing list if you like. Thank you. Tap, 
which uh, stands for Transition Autism Program. And we work in the Access and Disability Services Office at Harper. I'll refer to that as EDS, since it's level my level, right? And um, the reason that we developed this program was probably about five, six years ago, we identified that there was a significant increase in students um, on the autism spectrum coming to Harper. Um, and at that, in, so in fall of 2013, we had about 80 students registered with our office. So most of these students um, are um, they have uh, superior intellectual ability and they're college ready, so that is part of the requirement. Um, but the experience of transitioning from high school to um, college was really difficult. And so we just kind of brainstormed and were able, we were a grant and we were able to get that grant. And so we did some research uh, nationally. Um, to get some ideas on what would this program look like and how can we get this at Harper College. Um, so our goal really with Project TAP is um, just to, of course, have academic success, work on interpersonal relationships, and um, credential completion. So have students, you know, transition from high school to college and no matter how many years it takes, it doesn't necessarily have to be two years. Um, there's no hard and fast rule, even for neurotypical students these days, right? Not everybody is, just because they, we refer to it as a two-year college sometimes, we're definitely seeing different stories on the length of time that it might take to complete a degree. Um, so, um, we just really wanted to make sure that we were onboarding the students and the families, because if you think about it, families are very actively involved, K through 12, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're in college and it can be just like cut off like that, but that is not some, that is not an experience that we wanted our families to have. And so, uh, it's really exciting to kind of onboard a family and student and then over time see some of that responsibility and advocacy going to the student and then also encouraging and helping the parent to just let go a little bit at a time. So that's been really exciting. Um, so we just really wanted to improve our services um, for students and the autism The other thing, through our research and when we travel throughout the country looking at different programs that are for college ready students is there was a pretty substantial fee for those students and because Harper we're looking at the community we wanted to find out how can we incorporate this without a fee based so this program students do not have to pay um, to get those support services it's a non fee based program and um, it's been great because a lot of these students have gotten into U of I and Northwestern and Fourier schools, but they're not ready to um, transition there yet. So this is, uh, you know, what, how we decided to help them transition. We do workshops that start in the summer, so we bridge them from high school to um, the first day of school. So by the time they start, they're comfortable with the campus. They know people. Um, we, have, we do all their academic advising and accommodations, maybe what's the right schedule, um, maybe who's the right instructor for their learning styles. We try and um, do that, which is unique um, to Harper right now. There's, we also have a peer mentoring program, so each um, individual is assigned a peer mentor, and the peer mentors are trained throughout the summer, and then throughout the um, here, the peer mentors connect with their participant or student and just invite them to like social activities and connect with them, invite them to participate in different on campus activities and clubs. And it's been a great success because even someone to answer questions or ask questions that they might not want to ask us so they can ask their peer mentor. Um, and the feedback we've gotten from the mentors. 
um, has just been so positive because it really, just their own personal enrichment um, has been just such a bonus to this whole program. I just met with a peer mentor yesterday and uh, she was giving me feedback about the semester and um, she was so proud. It was really cute to see her as she talked about it just kind of come alive and uh, give me examples of um, helping her student like he wanted to go to the writing center and the tutoring center but was very intimidated. He knew where it was, but it wasn't about where is it. It's more about how does this work? How do I actually approach someone? And, and so she really helped him with that. She, she went with him multiple times. And then by the end of the semester, he's able to go now on his own. And so she was bragging about it yesterday. We do. Um, a lot of parent support, Michelle had talked about bridging the families, and so we do parent resource night. We also work with the parents because, again, with the K through 12, a lot of times parent contact was, um, they could just email the teachers and the teachers would respond, but at the college level and FERPA regulations, um, usually we're that person in between, so it, um, parents can contact us and then we'll be the speakers on their behalf with the faculty. We also have done a lot of faculty collaboration. Um, we just did a training this week for our faculty of how to work with individuals on the autism spectrum and um, within the class. We also, if students are in Project TAP, they're also part of an early alert. So that's a program that Harbor has that instructors can notify if there's any concerns, maybe the communication um, from the student to us or the student to the parent, they don't express that maybe they're not doing well, but this early alert program allows the professors to get in touch with us and try and intervene before um, things get too far. We do, um, in the spring of each uh, year, we work with the Job Placement Resource Center because we not only want these students to be able to transfer to a four-year school or to move on after their degree at Harper, we also want them to be able to <coughs> job ready as well. So the students in Project TAP earn a job ready badge, which means that they've gone to training and workshops about uh, resume interviewing and even um, obtaining jobs through the Job Placement Center. We just this year, it's really exciting, there's a faculty group at Harper that we were looking at how do these students, they can get through school, but getting a job, and that's the hardest part that we're doing. And so this faculty group um, has been working with Rochelle and I, and now we've been able to work with them for internship placements and helping the students get to that part of their degree where they need an internship. So now we're starting to develop internships on campus in the different areas uh, for these students. So that's pretty exciting. So um, we do a lot of social opportunities and meetings, <coughs> volunteer work with the students just to give them that neurotypical college experience. Well, the example, for, we had a holiday uh, gathering. To, uh, we, the volunteer part of it was we adopted a family from Palatine Township. And so students signed up for uh, bringing a gift. And then we all got together and were wrapping gifts. And then we also were playing games. And it was really fun to see the students, every single student, like we were playing, um, what was it, game? Charades. And every student went up in front and did it. And it was really fun. And that's what we try and do is incorporate social skill training, not where they're put in a class and do a group social work, because a lot of times these students have already have that in the K through 12, just natural type of social learning um, environments. So um, we also, uh, each year, we started this three years ago. We're going on um, the third year. And a lot of students, it was meant for a one-year program, but because of the retention rate, GPA, success, um, just the data that we have, these students have chosen um, some of them to stay throughout their three years. And so since it was so successful, we've just kind of going with it. Um, and so you know, we just started the process to take applications and things for the fall of 2018. So if 
a student um, wanted to be in Project TAP, uh, some uh, kind of a process is you first apply, of course, to Harper College. That is the first step. And then you make a, an appointment and you register with the, for an intake in the Access and Disability Services Office. And then bring in documentation, IEP, site evaluation, um, ACT, SAT scores, placement scores. Um, the requirement is that um, they have a, a diploma and that they have a 2.75 out of a 4.0 GPA. So part of the process is we have, uh, as Stacy talked about the parent <laughs> component, we have the parent fill out a supplement because parents can give us a lot of good information about their student. <laughs> and we have seen over the last few years, um, the, some of our students are have applied through the Department of Re um, Rehab Services, and they're actually paying for a lot of these students three years to go to the community college um, for the college ready student. And that's been a great opportunity for families to take advantage of having um, education paid for before that next step. So thank you. Judson University. Does anybody know where Judson is? Hey, a lot of people. That's impressive. Okay, so Judson is about 30 minutes from here uh, on Route 31 and Route 90. Um, it's a beautiful, small, 90-acre campus along the Fox River, and I'm here to talk about our new program called RISE. So, very much like CTC, uh, the RISE program was formulated by two moms that have children with Down syndrome. So, on the lower left there, you see Gail Giannopoulos with her four daughters, two of which have Down syndrome. This was Gail's vision for her daughters. She really wanted to make sure that all four of her daughters would have a college life experience. And so, she approached Judson about doing a program like this. And thankfully, the Vice President of uh, Enrollment Services and Strategic Planning, Nancy Binger, who's on the upper right there, had just found out that she was going to have a son with Down syndrome. So this was very near and dear to Nancy's heart as well, and so that's how the program got started. Both moms really wanted their uh, children to be able to go to a faith-based institution and have a college-like experience living on campus. And that's really what makes RISE unique among the schools here in Illinois. So our program is a two-year program in which the students receive a certificate in liberal arts. And they choose a subject area concentration, which will also be on that certificate. So in their second, third, and fourth semesters on campus, they take a traditional college class. And um, they will audit that class generally, but for some students, if they're able to um, and want to do all of the assignments, then the faculty may, as Tim talked about, may adjust the syllabus for our student. Um, in year one, all of our students are currently in an internship on campus. So we have students working at the library, plant operations, financial aid, the library, the fitness center. I mean, they're all over campus working, and they're doing a great job. The second year, by the way, we are in our first year of the program, just so you know. Um, next year, our students will be going off campus, and they'll have uh, internships with local businesses, which we're starting to uh, put together. So that's going to be really exciting. And our students also participate in community service projects. So this semester, we'll be doing some work at Habitat for Humanity and also um, with a local homeless shelter. RISE students are really an integral part of our campus, and we'll talk about that as we continue uh, through the presentation. But I think what's just been so rewarding to us is how much our campus has embraced our students. And as Tim talked about with his campus, inviting our students to be part of activities 
and wanting them to manage teams and wanting you can have girls on the cheerleading and dance teams because they were invited to be there. So it's really been fun. Um, a really cool aspect for a lot of parents that come and visit our campus is to know that Judson was recently named the third, third safest college campus in the United States by universities.com. So we're really excited about that. Our ideal student is age 18 to 25 with a diagnosed intellectual disability. <laughs> they have to have a high school diploma or equivalent. We are looking for practical reading and writing skills, so say fourth grade level is ideal or, or higher. Um, and really to have a desire to live on campus and to experience college life with traditional students. Our students live in the residence halls with other traditional students. We pair two RISE students in a room together and then they share the suite with a RISE resident advisor, um, which is fantastic. Um, the girls live in Ohio Hall and the boys live in Wilson. And so they are actually right across the quad from each other, but not in the same building. So one of the keys to the success of our program is all of the traditional student support that's part of it. So as we just talked about, we have RISE resident advisors. So there's one advisor for every two RISE students. Then we have RISE learning advisors um, during the week. Um, and I'll actually show you the, uh, a schedule shortly here. But um, we have specific times during the week that our students go to the library to work on assignments. And a learning advisor is in the library with those students. Typically, two to three RISE students per learning advisor in the library. Um, and they just work on assignments. And then um, when our students go to traditional classes, a learning advisor goes with them to that class. And just make sure that they're on track and understanding what's happening and maybe able to help them with assignments. And then we have RISE vocational advisors and they go to the internship times with our students. And um, right now, in total, we have 27 traditional students that are advisors for our program. This is a class schedule. It's very hard to read, so I, I don't even worry about reading it. But just to let you know, this is a typical um, schedule for the first year. This particular student has a couple things on here that um, other students don't have. So on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the schedule, it was professional skills was the first class, that teal colored class. We had chapel three times a week at Jetson's, a very important part of our program. Our, our students love going to chapel. They go with all the other traditional students, faculty, and staff. And it's just a great time of fellowship and learning and community. Um, and so they go there at 10 o'clock, person-centered planning at 11. And then in the afternoon, independent living, consumer math, and current events. And the students love talking politics. <laughs> it was so much fun to watch them uh, talk about politics and work on how, how are we going to solve the, the flooding in, in uh, Texas? Um, so it was really fun to watch. This particular student, um, the last thing in their day was choir. Um, and he's in the choir um, at Judson, which is awesome. Um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, personal fitness and wellness, daily living through Christian values. And then you'll see there's a thing here called the faith community. What that really is is it's an eight-week class that all of our freshmen at Judson take. It um, is a way for them to learn how to be a good citizen within the Judson community so they get to know each other. They get to know how do you establish relationships, um, you know, what are healthy boundaries, and things like that. Um, and then in the afternoon, this particular student was working at the president's office um, last semester. So that was his internship. So 
we talked a little about elective classes. So these are the subject area concentrations that our students can choose from, business and entrepreneurship, Christian ministries, creative arts, education, health and wellness, math and technology. Our current students have selected, have, well, the only one that hasn't been selected is math and technology. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, and as I said, they're starting to take these classes now, and um, most of them will be auditing the classes, but I think we're Christian ministries. We have a student that can, will be using a separate syllabus. And then just, there's a lot of activities on our campus. There's always something happening. And um, just wanted to give you a list of, of the things that happen. So Blue Crew and Spirit Squad are really great things. We have two girls that are on the cheerleading squad and dance team, and they are awesome. We, uh, the homecoming dance this year, we had nine of our students attended the dance, which actually was in Chicago, so we got a limousine for them to go downtown and come back, and they had an awesome time. Um, Taste of Judson is an international cuisines event. It's really fun. Fishing events, bingo, and then choir. Uh, we have a student in a choir this year. Um, sporting events, we have uh, all these sports are on our campus, and we actually have three RISE students that are currently managing sports, sports teams between men's basketball and track and field. And then we also have intramural sports, and we're encouraging our students to participate in those, and they have said they're very interested, so. Um, and then every week, we have our students create an email to, the, to their parents so that they can tell them about the highlights of their week, uh, what they learned about themselves, if there was anything that was hard for them that week. Um, we want to uh, create that uh, communication. Um, and then we develop a newsletter every two or three, every semester so that we can bring all the families up to date on some of the fun things that are happening. So in fact, this most recent one, I think the funnest thing was that our students decided they wanted to do a gift shop for Christmas. So they literally made like Christmas cards, they made ornaments, they made food and beverage items, and they had this great gift shop and they actually made a 23% profit <laughs> on their gift shop. I was very proud of them. Like, good job, you guys. Um, and then the last thing on this is just anytime parents and guardians are welcome to call us with any kind of questions or issues. These are our students this year, which has really been fun. And in the middle there, you can see the picture of them getting ready to get it on the limo for the homecoming dance. But, um, it's just been a really amazing first semester. So thank you for listening. So I'm Nina Johnson. I work for Minnesota Life College. Um, and as Tim said, I am not going to be up there else fair, but it's not because I'm going to be washing my hair. I'll probably be dying in death. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry I just won't be able to make it for that. But I. <laughs> um, but Minnesota Life College uh, is a program we've been around for 23 years. We were started by a mom, and this mother had a child who was on the autism spectrum, and she was looking for a college experience for her child. She couldn't find one that fit her needs, so she just decided to make her own. Um, and that's kind of how a lot of our programs started. Uh, we are really lucky. I'm happy to talk a lot about our presentation, but I do have, I'm really lucky and I'm surprised that they're here, but I have two of our fantastic parent ambassadors here in the audience. Um, I have a parent of a senior here, um, Ron Fuel, can you just wave? There we go. Uh, and I also have a parent of one of our graduates, Robbie Bryant's mom, Trina. So we have two parents here if you want to, you know, actually hear the experience from people that are going through it. So Minnesota Life College is based on the idea of real skills for real life. We are called a college, but we are not a traditional college like some of these other programs. We are not affiliated with the University of Minnesota or St. Thomas. We're not situated on a traditional college campus. We are our own separate program. Originally, we were started for individuals who kind of fall through the cracks. 
kids who might not be quite ready for college yet or may never be ready for a traditional academic college, but need something more than just high school transition program and then mom and dad's basement. Mm -hmm. So we really wanted to figure out what is that middle ground. And throughout the 23 years we've been around, our population has changed. We do still have many students who MLC will be their college experience, but we also have students who come to us after they have gotten a four-year degree. We have students who go on to traditional college after they're with us, and we have students that start in traditional college, find that it's a little more challenging than they thought, take a gap period of time, come to us, build up their self-confidence, and then go back and complete their degree. So we've got kind of a full mix of students. We do serve students with autism spectrum disorder and learning differences. So we've got a big range of people. We have people with ADD uh, and ADHD. We've got people whose primary diagnosis is anxiety. We have some individuals who've had traumatic brain injury. We have lots of people all across the spectrum. We really have a mix of students, and it's kind of a nice fit, but it really challenges us all the time. How do we make sure that the students who are on the spectrum are getting what they need, while the students who have ADD or are dealing with dyslexia get what they need, and the student who really is academically great but is just really struggling with anxiety gets what they need as well. So. The reason that we were started is because if you don't have a program and you've got a kid with autism or learning differences, their outlook kind of post high school can be a little, little grim. Uh, Drexel University has an autism institute and they've done a longitudinal research study on what happens to people on the spectrum after high school. Um, we also have some research about individuals with learning differences. And these aren't great odds if you don't have something to go to. Over half of individuals with learning differences report involvement with the criminal justice system within eight years after leaving high school. That's not because they're bad kids getting into trouble. It's because they're kids that are in the wrong place at the wrong time and don't know how to advocate for themselves. Or it's somebody who's desperate for friends and somebody who's maybe a little unsavory says, hey, if you do this, I'll be your friend. And they go, great, sign me up, whatever you want me to do. We don't want that to happen. It's really important that our students learn advocacy, learn what really is a friend. A friend isn't going to ask you and say, I'll only be your friend if you give me money, or I'll only be your friend if, you know, in private, but in public I'm going to ignore you. We want them to really learn what friends are so they don't get in these situations. 89% of individuals on the spectrum are still living in their parents' homes. There's kind of this idea, and it's changing a lot, but when people from you know, previous generations, when you think about adults with autism, you sort of think of the grown-up in the basement or the grown-up living in some sort of structure you've created for them in your backyard. And we don't want that. Our students, 90% of them will never go and back to their own homes when they enroll in our program. They're not going, I mean, they'll come back and visit, not like they're going to leave you forever, but they're not going to come and move into your, you know, your guest room. So we want families to know that they're perfectly capable of living independently. Over a quarter of individuals with autism and learning differences after high school are socially isolated and haven't seen a friend in a year. Some of them had friends in high school and then the friends graduated and went off and did other things. Others of them have never had a friend at all. A lot of times in our program when we talk to kids and we say, who is your primary social group? A lot of times, primary social outlet, mom and dad. Or if we say, who's your best friend? And we poke a little more, we realize who their best friend is, is a para you know, is a staff person in the school where they don't have friends that are peers. We work so hard to help our students have real, true friendships and social lives. And that's one of the big reasons why even though our students come to us from 28 states and across the world, when they go to Minnesota Life College, when they're done with our program, they stay. Because a lot of them say, for the first time in my whole life, I have friends real friends, and I don't want to move away from that. I want to stay with the people that I care about, who care about me. And there's also two times the unemployment rate above, I mean, the national unemployment rate, twice as likely to be unemployed if you are, have autism or a learning difference. Our students, this year, 100% of our seniors will graduate with full-time employment. On average, it's between 95 and 100% of our students graduate with jobs. And so, and it isn't just, hey, you got a job, and it's okay if you quit the day after graduation. That's not our goal. We want to find out that they've graduated and they're maintaining their jobs. In addition, all of our students who are employed are making above the minimum wage. So it's not just that they're getting some sort of job where it's like, we're going to pay you this amount, 
and you're going to feel happy about that is we want them to have the minimum wage or higher and all of them do and we're working towards our students being full-time with benefits that's what we really want for them a living wage because it's hard to be independent if you can't pay your bills so we have three programs this, the first one is if you've got a kid who's still in high school, we've got something called the Summer Internship Program. We call it like a sip of independence. It's not whole gulp, it's a sip. <laughs> and you're just taking it for three weeks, where you're coming to our school for three weeks in the summer, and the students get experience living away from their family on our campus. Our campus is a little unusual. It's part of an apartment complex. So they're living in apartments, not in you know tents or not in a college dorm. So they are, it's a different kind of camp. It's like a city summer camp. So they're living in apartments. They are going to all sorts of activities that we have in the Twin Cities. They're experiencing a variety of different jobs and they're getting that taste of independence because they have to do their own laundry. They have to cook. We don't have a cafeteria. If you don't cook, you starve. So it's okay if you don't know how to cook, we'll help you learn so you don't starve. But it's important, you know, for students, they really get a little taste of what could it be like after high school if I weren't staying at my parents' house anymore. And that program is for individuals ages 17 to 20. So if you've got a student, actually it's 16 to 20. So if you've got a 10th grader and above and you're wondering, what do I do with them this summer? They can come to Minneapolis in July. It's lovely there. <laughs> uh, then a lot of our students, not all of them, um, but a lot of the students do the summer internship program and then either three weeks after they leave, they come back and start our undergraduate program, or once they graduate high school, they come back and do our undergraduate program. People can enroll in the undergraduate program between the ages of 18 to 26. So our freshmen this year, we have people that came immediately out of high school. We have students who started after they completed their state's transition program. And we had people that were just sort of knocking around trying to figure out what am I supposed to do in the world. And at 25, their parents said, no, nope, no more. You cannot live in our home. We have to take something else out. So we've got a huge range of individuals and ages that come to our program. But all of them are there to learn the skills they need to be independent. And then we have a program called the Community Living Program, which students can only do if they've gone through our undergraduate program. So my parent, Trina, back there, her son, Robbie, is in the community living program. And Ron's son, Michael, is going to be doing the community living program. And so this is a lifelong, so these are lifelong services. A person can use them for a couple years. They can use them for their whole life. It's whatever they need to help maintain their independence. And the services that are included in the community living program are everything from social activities, that are planned, if it's, some, if it's challenging for a student to kind of make those, initiate those social plans on their own. Maybe they don't need that, maybe their parents live in another state or another country and they just want somebody checking in on them in their living space to make sure it's clean, everything, nothing's broken, they have enough food. Maybe they just need somebody to help them go through bills and determine what's a bill and what's junk mail. So families really get to pick from a menu of services that will allow their student or their graduate to be independent. So we teach real skills for real life. Um, our students would not be in a setting like this. If our students are going to learn how to do something, they're not sitting staring at a screen. They're learning how to do it by doing it. So our students learn how to cook and clean because teachers come into their apartments and teach them how to cook in their own place with their own food. We have teachers that teach at the grocery store. We have teachers that teach on the bus. We have teachers that teach classes at restaurants. An example of a class might be where the students go with our transportation teacher, take the public bus to a restaurant, a social skills teacher meets them at the restaurant and they learn how to have social skills and eat with the right fork and you know eat with your mouth closed and what do you talk about at the restaurant. And then the banking and budgeting teacher might magically appear at the end and help them pay the bill and figure out their tip. So that would be one class, but it would really be three different things happening at once, but that could just be a very typical experience for them. We want them to learn things in the settings that they'll actually be using those skills. And we do them in as many different places as possible because we want our students to be able to do that multiple places, not go, well, I only can eat at Perkins because that's where I went once. So we want them to be able to go, I can order at any restaurant. I can take any bus. 
So the five sort of the components of what we teach and how we teach it, we teach social emotional learning. It's really hard to be independent if you're lonely and isolated and that can go along with mental health so issues. So we want our students to learn how to have friends. We want them to learn how to date and have relationships and get married. We have multiple couples that have gotten married in our program who've met one another because of the program. Um, we also want our students to learn how their relationship with their parents and siblings will change as they get more independent. And we want their parents to learn that too. Because when our kids come home, we don't want them to be like, Mom, here's all my laundry, do it for me. No, they know how to do it themselves. So we want parents to understand that relationship will change. Vocational, we want our students to have a job. If you don't have a job, you can't pay your bills. I'll talk about that in a second. Independent living, this is the basic keeping yourself alive stuff. The no, you cannot clean your entire house from top to bottom with your toilet brush. Um, yeah. The no, you can't like make hamburger patties on your counter and then just walk away and never wipe it off again and it'll be okay. And the no, you can't like, we had a student, a lovely student who went home for winter break and for three weeks, but right before they left, ordered like 10 takeout meals and just left them in the fridge so they'd be ready when he got back and he wouldn't have to cook. No. So, so I mean, it was a really great thought, really great thought. Um, healthy living. A lot of our students, and as many of you know who are parents, your, your child may have a palate about this wide. So we want to help them try to expand that, make healthier choices in what they eat, okay? Um, and also make sure that they've got exercise, mental health, all of that. And then team building and community, we want our students to be part of the community. Integration and inclusion is incredibly important to us. At MLC, the community is our classroom. We're on campus very rarely because there's so many things to do and see in Minneapolis. We'd rather have our students there. Um, vocational, we do have career certificates. Our students don't just get general career training. They actually get career certificates in specific fields. Right now, we have hospitality, culinary, and retail. Starting next fall, we'll be adding a fourth certificate, something in the health sciences or the health field. Um, and not only do students get this career training, they actually graduate with 35 continuing education credits that they can transfer to a college if they wanted to do so. Um, and this is basically just a picture to show you that when students start, they don't know a lot, but when they graduate, they know a lot. We don't let people graduate and say, hey, you've been here for three years, you're done. We say, hey, you've been here for three years, you've gotten all the skills you need in order to be independent, you're ready to graduate. Some students graduate in two years, some students take four. We don't want to have anybody leave before they're ready. I will be done because I want to make sure that Pace has their time, but I have a lot of material up here and I'm happy to stay after as long as you need because my flight doesn't go back till tomorrow. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, I'll be here up. Hello, my name is TC Schneck. I am from the PACE program at National Lewis University, and we are located in downtown Chicago. So PACE stands for Path to Academics, Community, and Employment. Uh, we were established in 1986 by a group of special education teachers in, uh, from New Trier High School in Winneka, and we are a three-year post-secondary college experience program. Um, so once you graduate our program, we offer a cert certificate of completion, um, as well as two extended programming options, Pace Ahead and Pace Beyond. Um, so we found that some of our students, once they graduated the program, they maybe needed a little extra support, uh, whether that be in independent living or employment or social skills. Uh, so we created these two options um, that they can carry on um, throughout their entire adult life should they want to stay connected to the program. So PACE students are ages 18 to 28, all with intellectual disabilities. Uh, we have a lot of students on the autism spectrum, as well as students with just um, general executive functioning disabilities. Um, students with ADHD, uh, students with mental health um, issues. Um, it's really a wide gamut of students. Um, they are all however, lacking those um, executive functioning and planning skills. Um, that's where we kind of come together. Some of our students do um, participate in their high school's transition program. Some of them come straight from high school at age 18. And we focus on four core areas of learning. Functional academics, um, employment, social development, and independent living skills. 
So our functional academics, uh, these are classes that are not uh, traditional learning classes. So our students are taking classes like money management where they're learning how to cash a check each week and work, um, work off an $85 budget per week. Um, they take classes like health and wellness. So um, you know, learning uh, what are healthy foods that I need to be eating? How do I stay mentally healthy? Um, social skills is another course where they're learning how to plan activities in the community. So all of our classes that our students are taking, they're able to apply uh, in real life situations. Um, so if they're in the classroom learning the concepts, they're executing them um, at the dorm or in the community. So we offer 10 week academic quarters. Um, classes, oops, oops. So classes for our first year students are two days a week at National Lewis, which is downtown um, in Chicago. And they're discussion and experiential base. Uh, so we are often spending a lot of time reviewing what was previously discussed and then before diving into the next topic of conversation. We want to make sure that um, we're building up what we're learning and not just getting through our curriculum because that's what um, our curriculum tells us to do. So we're focusing on a concept before we're moving on to another. Uh, and they're all independent living skill centric. So we're bringing it back to how does this relate to our students uh, living in their apartment with their roommates. Students present quarterly portfolio presentations, which is kind of a showcase of all of the skills that they've learned over the quarter. Uh, throughout the quarter, they're gathering physical evidence, which is typically themselves taking pictures of them, completing a task, or doing an app to show that, hey, I learned the skill. Here's me, you know, price shopping or price comparing at the grocery store and hopefully picking the cheaper option. <laughs> uh, Students also receive bi-weekly advising from PACE instructors um, in addition to uh, other counseling services that they receive from our counselor. Uh, instructors check in with them just to kind of uh, see how they're doing in all four components of the program and um, help navigate any issues that may arise. So we have focused heavily on employment preparation. Um, as a first year student, students are um, interning 12 hours a week so two days for six hours at a time at a community partner <coughs> site. Um, and we're building on, the first year is based heavily on assessment, and then we're building on what skills that they have. Um, in addition to their internship site, students take an employment seminar and employment experience class. So they're able to discuss what's happening at their internship site in the classroom. Um, so that's a neat experience where um, you know, oftentimes we're discussing the soft skills that need to happen at the workplace. All of our students have the skills it takes to, you know, the are able to physically do the job, um, but it's those <coughs> social skills where things kind of fall apart or go awry. Um, also in the classroom, they are able to hear about their, um, the, their classmates' experience at their internship site, um, and maybe it's in a different sector that they never thought they'd be interested in, but now it sounds kind of interesting. So like I said, year one, students are working two days per week. Um, their first internship site, uh, they go through two internship sites their first year. The first one is exploration and adjustment. So um, based off of our intake process, we determine where we would place the student um, after consulting with the student and their family. Um, and then they switch halfway through the year um, where we're focusing heavily on the skills that they need to get the job. The third year, or the second year, they increase their work to three days a week, and we're really focusing on the steps to employment. So what do we need to do to get you a job? Um, brushing up on your resume, practicing interview skills, scheduling interviews in the community. And then by the year three, uh, they're working at least four days per week, um, whether that the objective is for them to have a job. If it's not a job, then they're volunteering while actively looking for a job. Uh, here are some of our community partners. Um, so we have internships in a variety of sectors. Um, for students who, we have a lot of students who are interested in childcare. Um, we have students who are interested in food service. So they go to Northwestern University and work in the Norris Center or DePaul University with their catering center. Um, one of our largest sites is Rush University Medical Center and they offer a huge variety of internship um, experiences being at hospital um, from patient transport to volunteer services. Um, there's really just a lot of things that happen at the hospital. 
Um, and then we also have a lot of students who are interested in animal care. So they work at pet shops. Um, the Shedd Aquarium is a big internship site that we scored this year, so that was also very exciting for our students. Um, all of our students take independent living skills, um, and this happens in their dorm or in their apartment. Um, so their apartments are, or their, their housing is apartment style housing. Um, it's located in Lincoln Park, right next to DePaul University. It's not associated with DePaul University, but just so happens there are a lot of DePaul students who live in the building, um, and then our students live in the building as well. So all of the apartments have a full kitchen with an oven and a stove and a refrigerator, uh, two full bathrooms, and four individual bedrooms. Um, so students are learning how to function, they're learning how to live with other roommates, live with their peers, um, and how to keep an apartment livable. Um, there's no cleaning service, there's no cleaning staff, um, so when the toilet clogs, and it has and it will continue, they're learning how to plunge the toilet. Um, it's, they're learning the necessary skills that they need to live in an apartment successfully. So their instructor is coming into their unit with them and showing them, this is how you turn on the stove. Uh, this is how you turn on the oven. This is how you clean out your fridge. This is what you do when your fridge collects water. Um, so they're, they're learning these very important skills. Uh, this instruction happens all day on Fridays for first year students. Um, and then as they graduate, as they continue out through the program, they are getting um, two hour blocks of time with their instructor throughout the week. So here are our areas of focus for independent living life skills. So cooking, cleaning, self-care, transportation, time management, money management, and problem solving. Um, so for cooking, we really want our students to learn how to follow a recipe, create a grocery list, a meal plan, and execute it. Um, our students do have access to DePaul University Dining Center for dinners during the week. But other than that, uh, so they are, they are allowed to eat at DePaul Sunday through Thursday dinner. The rest of the meals, breakfast and lunch, they need to be preparing throughout the week. And then Friday and Saturday, uh, they budget to go out in the community with their friends. Uh, so we do have a heavy focus on cooking and healthy eating. Um, our students right now just got back from the grocery store. And um, when I get to the dorm today, if they didn't make healthy choices, they have to go back and they have to make returns, which <laughs> awesome. nobody likes. But they really only have to do it once or twice before they don't repeat those mistakes. <laughs> um, so a lot of our students were working on creating healthy hygiene routines. Um, so you know, really going into the step by step of what needs to happen when I get into the shower, um, not just letting the water run over me, but creating a nice lather um, and rinsing it off. Um, our students are also learning how to uh, navigate public transportation. We rely heavily on the CTA. Um, so our, our housing facility is in Lincoln Park and our academic class um, classes happen in the loop and the internship site can happen somewhere in between or somewhere maybe a little further. Um, so all of our students learn how to navigate uh, the L trains and the buses as a group um, and with buddies and as we um, feel confident in their ability to navigate them themselves, they start to travel independently. Uh, time management is also very huge for our students, so learning how to uh, utilize your phone and your calendar and setting alarm, uh, alarms and reminders. Uh, money management is something that we're continually working on with our students. Uh, so all of our students, when they come to our program, they go on to a cash budget, um, and we lock up those debit cards or leave them at home because it's such, you know, cash is much more concrete than swiping a debit card. And we're also um, always referring back to the problem solving method that we teach our students and how to effectively analyze information and make informed decisions based on whatever issue they're experiencing. Another large uh, component of our program is social development. So we want our students to have you know, rich and fulfilling relationships with their peers. Um, so our students take an entire class on social skills and every Saturday they are participating in some sort of event in the um, Chicago community. So um, in, the, in the, the social planning class, they are presented with the event. They know um, where they're going and the time frame that was set, but everything else is kind of up to them. 
So how are we gonna get there? What do we need? How much money do we need? What are we gonna do once we get to the shed, um, for example? Uh, what are we eating for lunch? What's the weather gonna be like? What should I wear? So all of those questions and all those things that kind of um, come naturally for a lot of people that don't come naturally for our students, they have to sit down in a class and kind of figure it out. So when Saturday comes, they're ready to go and it's not this last minute scramble um, you know, full of anxiety and stress, because um, that's, that's not fun. Uh, we also offer a lot of social planning in the dorm. Uh, we have nightly clubs for all of our students and the Saturday student life activities. Uh, again, that happens in the social planning course that students take. Uh, we also partner with DePaul University for a Best Buddies program, uh, since you know a lot of students did experience that in high school and they'd like to continue on with that once they go on to their next step. Um, all of our students are required to take, um, to receive counseling from our in-house therapist. And then we also offer counseling groups um, based on uh, cohorts or special topic counseling groups. So our admissions process. Um, so we highly encourage a campus and dorm tour uh, just to kind of see what you know, where we are, we're right downtown, so it's very vibrant and lively. Um, we have an application with um, supporting materials. We ask for letters of reference. Um, there's a committee view, review, and then an interview with the student family and the student and family together. Um, we may also recommend shadow days, uh, where a student can come in and, you know, see what, see our classes for the day, go to dinner with our students, um, hang out at the dorm for a little bit. And then um, once the application process are committed, we like the turnaround is rather quick. Within a month, we inform you of our decision. Uh, the tuition and cost. So the total cost is about $43,000. That includes um, room and board and meals. And we do offer scholarships based on financial need. And our students are eligible for Pell Grants uh, determined by FAFSA. And that is all I have.